All right, uh, good morning everybody. Um, I'm trying to get a lot done in a short uh, period of time. But I thought I'd start by uh, just making a quick comment about what happened in Las uh, Vegas last night. Um, you know, Las Vegas is a very important city to, to us. Uh, we have employees there. Uh, we have a very significant customer base there. Uh, we've had incredible support from that city over the years for all the events that I know many of you have been at. And um, our thoughts and our prayers are with everybody who's been affected by it. And uh, I know everybody here in the audience shares the same feeling. So I just wanted to make sure I made that statement before we got started. All right, with that, uh, let's put the agenda up. Let's talk a little bit about what I'm going to try and get done in the next hour. If, uh, if, if I'm capable and I get great support here in the audience. First, I'm going to talk quickly about the macro and economics that are driving the business world and frankly affecting IT, and they're big. And we'll talk a little bit about the leaders that, that run companies and, and what they're thinking about and the issues and challenges that they have. And then I'm going to try and segue to, um, to why the cloud is now driving IT. You heard some of that last night from Larry, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, today. We'll talk about our strategy. And then the last couple of years, we've made predictions about what's going to happen in the market. And I'm going to do something a little different this year in the sense that I'm going to talk about those predictions that we've made and how we're looking relative to those happening. And uh, when we get there, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about it, but that's what we'll do. And then we're going to have some customers come up and join us and talk about, you know, what they're doing and why they're doing it and how it reflects back on this entire set of market trends. So that's the plan. We're going to try and get that done. I see there's still a lot of people coming in, but at least everybody who's here right now will get the framing for, uh, for the agenda. Okay, that's the next hour. I'm going to try and stay on pace. So here we go. First. Let me start with the macroeconomics. Here they are. They're not necessarily great, so let me try to give you some context for them. GDP, which of course is gross domestic product, uh, we all, sometimes I ask people in the audience, pick them out, all of them want to do this, to tell me what GDP is and all of that. Not a lot of people do, but it, not a, a lot of everybody knows what it is, but it is really the size of worldwide commerce. And, it's been growing about a couple of points a year for the past five years. So if you, if you sort of said 75 trillion is GDP, growing about 2%, these are roughly right numbers, you have about 1.5 trillion of growth. That's 2% of 75 trillion. 40% of that is in just one country, and that is China. And so 60, only 60% 60 of that is outside China, so that's less than a trillion dollars. Why is that important? Because that's really how companies think about growth. Generally, my company should grow roughly, roughly as fast as GDP. And if I don't have exposure to China, hard to see more than 1% growth. And then when you look at what happens in corporate performance, the, the, the lower right of the revenue box, it bears itself out in corporate performance. The Standard & Poor's 500 growth rate and revenue over the last five years, 1%. Why 1%? Roughly equivocates back to GDP. So that's a little bit why the GDP and the corporate performance numbers are so important to interrelate together. You can see the effect it's had on business IT. Business IT, which is roughly a trillion of the 75 trillion, just really not a lot of growth over the past five years. By the way, not a surprise. It's equivalent roughly to what's happened in GDP and as a result, the reflection inside corporate performance. So business to business IT, not a lot of growth. Problem in the lower left is the consumer growth is growing. Consumer IT is growing 20% per year and has been for a while. So the customers, particularly people that have exposure to B2C, anybody who's hiring new employees, there's a lot of dynamics now in all the capabilities that now your customers have, your employees have, and companies not really in a position to invest significantly to pursue all that. Okay? So that's, I try, I try to put all, a lot of data here on one page, but really trying to give you some context for the macro economy, how that's driven into corporate performance, and how that relates uh, back to both consumer and to business IT. In the lower right, I tried to really try to 
summarize just a lot of activity in, in, in one little box, but very little revenue growth. Companies really trying hard to squeeze out profits through a little bit of revenue growth. And as you all know that are here representing companies, companies that are really trying to squeeze out um, efficiency, cut expenses, find new ways to do things, invest in different capabilities, but all with an objective to eventually try to improve their bottom line, but cutting expenses at the same time as they're trying to grow revenue. And just at the bottom of the page, I put a few companies that have been affected. I mean, if you look at, if you don't know this, use this as your own stat. Uh, since 2000, half the Fortune 500 is gone. 2000 Fortune 500, go dial to 2017, almost half the names are gone. It's an amazing thing, huh? just think half are gone. You think about why. I mean, I, I use some names. They take somebody like Blockbuster. I don't know, again, how many of you went to Blockbuster this weekend to get uh, a video? You know, probably tough to execute, right? They've been disintermediated through technology, uh, basically Netflix, and they're gone. They're gone. Borders. I don't know how many of you went to, you know, go get a book recently. It's quite hard to do. Been disintermediated again through technology. There's a whole set of dynamics occurring in the business world that some very much driven by stuff we talk about here at this conference that frankly just don't change technology eventually weave their way in to changing a macroeconomic trend or a business trend that affects frankly the existence of some of these companies. So a lot of companies going out of business, the speed of companies going out of business, literally not existing anymore in the Fortune 500, is not decelerating, it's actually accelerating. So if you look at the list of the Fortune 500 in 2017, high probability that a decade from now, 11, 12 years, you might see half of them gone. So that's the acceleration of IT in all the time. Okay, busy chart, a lot of stuff, but I don't have a lot of time, so I tried to make sure I covered as much of that as I could. Next, uh, next chart. These are still the corporate fundamentals. No matter who you work for, no matter what your role is, the company you work for is probably trying to execute the very simple fundamentals, starting with grow revenue. More revenue, generally speaking, is good. I'm looking at, there's some horrible people in the front. You all have that as a general, more revenue, good. Okay, this takes training though. More revenue is good. If you can get more revenue while you spend less, that's generally really good more revenue, spend less. These manifest themselves in all sorts of crazy projects you'll hear about. We've got a customer intimacy program or retention program. You'll hear all these words. They're all around helping to grow revenue. Keep your customers, try to get somebody else's. Spend less while you do it. Be more efficient uh, in everything you do. Try to make processes simpler, easier, all of this stuff. All on the objective now of improving cash flow. Generally, those first three bullets have been what have hired or promoted and fired CEOs. Now there's a fourth one emerging, and that's this management of risk. And it's been very much in the news over the past couple of years of things that happen that cause companies to implode. Reputational risk. You've seen it with some of the security attacks that occur. Things where now it isn't good enough just to run a good company. It isn't good enough to just grow revenue. It isn't good enough to keep your spend down to increase earnings. You have to do it and make sure that you're managing your risk simultaneously. We'll talk a little bit about that. It actually goes back to something Larry talked about last night, but just now the implication of security on all of our companies and all that we do. But managing risk now very important. Innovating the business, the ways to do things different innovative business models. We'll talk about that. There are many disruptors. In fact, we'll have uh, a couple of them that we'll, we'll have uh, with us today who are disrupting various industries with just brand new business models. I'm just going to do what you do, but I'm going to do it completely differently. We'll talk about that. And again, if you want to get somebody else's customers, i got to have a better product in most cases, or i got to deliver better service, and in the end, i got to be able to have the customer get benefit from my services better than they have from my competitor. Remember, with 1% GDP growth, you know, let's take Oracle, I can't help but, but bring Oracle up. When we grow 
7% in an industry uh, that's growing one or flat, we can't do it by, by growth rate of the industry. We have to get somebody else's customers, which means we have to do a better job. We have to have better products or better services, deliver a better customer experience. They're still the very same fundamentals. So those are still the same corporate fundamentals today. I'm just really adding this management of risk as uh, one that's now becoming as core as some of the others. Next chart. Yeah, this is a bad picture. I feel bad for this guy. But but the pressure, the pressure is 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 growing. I'm very empathetic to the to, to the CEOs. Uh, the the CEO tenure again. I've said this in 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 multiple events, but I want to make sure that tenure of the CEO. Is, is declining, it's not inclining, for the very reason I described earlier. Average CEO lasts about 18 quarters, so you know you get about four and a half years, so you don't have time for massive transformations. You have lots of activists at your door who are um, incredible pressure to do things faster, quicker, better. Uh, they don't really care about your strategy, your long-term view, they just really want performance. They want performance and they want it fast. Uh, technology innovation and customer adoption is increasing faster than their IT capabilities can keep up. So as I said earlier, you've got a consumer innovating, growing 20%, lots of companies supplying these consumers with lots of capabilities. You're trying hard to keep up. You've got 20-year-old applications. If you don't know that stat, the average app is about 20 years old in, in this country. The average infrastructure is six to seven years old, supporting that 20 year old application infrastructure. And 80% is generous. 85% of, of, of IT budgets is spent on basically just keeping the existing systems running. So almost very little innovation. At 15% of innovation, 10 to 85% kept the systems running. I don't want to take a poll in this room. I've, I've actually done it in smaller uh, round tables where customers will say 90% of my budget is on maintenance. 90%. So if you said 15 or 10, whatever number you want to insert is my innovation budget. What comes out of that budget? Innovation, sure. If the, if the CEO says we're going to cut expenses, where do you think it comes from? Let's stop the order system or shrink the innovation budget? Shrink the innovation budget. CEO says, okay, my board just told me they don't want to be hacked. You know, board comes in, they have some great thoughts. We have any, I don't know if we have any of our board members here, but you know, they don't want to get hacked. You know, and like, okay, are we going to get hacked? Like, no, we're not going to get hacked. Good, we don't want to get hacked. Okay, somebody says, Let's go see the CEO, CIO, are we going to get hacked? The CIO says, well, I don't know. We also have more money spent on security. Where do you think it comes from? Innovation budget. So what happens is the innovation budget continues to shrink and you've got to find a way to compete with, in many cases, disruptors. I've just given you a couple of examples left uh, in the car ownership auto industry and the disruption that's occurring uh, in that industry. Bloom, who will actually join us on stage. Stripe, Warby, uh, you know, the ability now to buy eyeglasses online and basically disintermediate an entire set of the industry. And, and we've got house down here, but all of these disruptors that basically say, I'm just going to enter your market and I'm not going to take any of the legacy, I'm going to disrupt all the traditional norms, and now I've got to compete with them, and I've got to compete with them with all of this legacy. Really, really hard work. Next chart. Then add to it this security thing. I, I, let me start on security with, without trying to be too dire, whatever bad is going to happen, I, I'm telling you, the next event could be bigger than, than you think. We've seen some things that nobody likes, and clearly we've seen, you know, as Larry talked about, OPM, my date has been lost uh, to nation states, my date, you know, so, you know, it all comes back to being about, about all of us personally. And we've seen things that have not been comfortable at all. There are things that, that I can imagine that could be bigger. And, and this thing is going to get more serious, not less serious. And in the end, it, it is going to come back on CEOs in the end, I mean, something as simple as patching, as, as Larry talked about last night. Uh, the average patch, just to give you an example, I mean, it's come out a lot in this Equifax thing, that a patch that was a couple of months uh, tardy in being, in being implemented. Well, at Oracle, we put patches into our cloud, and on average, 
it's about a year. It's about a year before those patches all get, on average, get integrated uh, into our systems. Why? It's hard. You all know that. Most of you here at this conference are involved in that work. It's hard. Hard to get these patches done. Lots of hardware, different hardware, lots of different operating systems, lots of different versions of database. You gotta have downtime to do it. We go through all of the reasons. But it's, it's hard. Now, when you go explain to consumers that patching is hard, therefore you've lost this or that, nobody cares. Nobody cares how hard it is. It's on, it's on you, the company, and as Larry said, whether you're the CEO, I might add, the CTO, because he's coming too. I mean, so we're all, we're all at risk if we get into these sorts of situations, and it's going to be a situation that has to be addressed. So it is, it is a big deal, and readiness today is going to become a bigger issue than, than ever, ever, ever before. I tell one quick antidote before I get off this chart. I was at a meeting with one of the uh, CEOs of, I'll, I'll just say, one of the biggest banks in the world. And we had an hour scheduled. We spent half of the meeting talking about patching. Can you believe that? CEO, one of the biggest banks, talking about patching. I started with, I'm, I'm just impressed you know what it is. And he's like, oh yeah, 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 no, I get it. And he goes, you know what? We patch, and how long it takes us to patch your systems? And I'm like, no. And he says, four to five months. And you know what's in my head? That's good. That's good. You're doing a good job. And he's like, this is a disaster. If I explain to my board, to my customers, that there was a patch available for Oracle Systems, and we got penetrated, and I didn't have that system patched, it's not good. I have to find innovative ways to change this because the risk associated with this is just huge. So again, I just want to make sure I made that point. Uh, let's go to the next chart. And, and I'll tell you, we're here in the Silicon, we're not quite in the Silicon Valley. If you went a little south, you'd get to the Silicon Valley, 22 miles long, six miles wide, most of it's sitting between 101 and 280. And, and some of this has been hoisted upon all the customers by, by us. Uh, we, we generally speaking had fantastic engineers building pieces. And then we've, sent, we've sold those pieces to customers and told customers to put all of this complexity together into what now become systems, what become applications, what become infrastructure. And that that complexity has driven to all of this very difficult environment to maintain, to upgrade, to innovate, et cetera, et cetera. So again, as the Valley continues to, to do well, and by the way, I think the Valley's done a great job in many respects, but making things simple has not been one of them. Building an operating system that hasn't been integrated with a microprocessor, at least designed that way from the get-go, a database not aligned with that, you can go right down each piece and then forcing the customer, not forcing so to speak, but saying to the customer, you put all this together, creates incredible permutations of configurations uh, and changes and maintenance and patching and all of this that makes the environment that's actually out there today very complicated to go, to go deal with. Next chart. And that's why really cloud has, has evolved as it has. Um, first of all, you know, what is it? I mean, this really becomes scale, optimized, secured stacks of intellectual property. That's at the core of what a cloud is. You can talk about whether it's at the infrastructure layer, at the platform layer, at the application layer, but it is a scaled, optimized, secured stack. It's typically based on standards, and in most cases, you're gonna find most clouds have, I'll just take about the Oracle Cloud. Do you know how many configurations that we have in the Oracle Cloud? One. One. It's scale. It's very large, but it's one. One platform. Larry talked about last night, Exadata. One operating system, one version of the database, one standard set of features. So whose job do you think is easier upgrading, modernizing, patching that environment? 
Yours or ours? Ours. And it's all based on standards and it's all built from the ground up, optimized to perform a certain task. And part of the promise of the cloud is that you now transfer the burden I just described from you, from your IT budget, to the industry's R&D budget. And that's really the transfer that's going on today. I want to move this risk, I want to move this complexity, I want to move this cost, and I want to move it from here to there, i.e. from you to me. And why? I mean, it starts with, I, 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 you know, it just costs less. By the way, I think if you've got no other benefit than it just costs less, given my beginning charts about the macroeconomics, you'd do it anyway. Somebody said, let it just cost 30% less and everything's the same. What do you think the CEO from the first page said? Yes! Do that. But the fact it does more, it costs less. You now get the opportunity to get innovation without, because there's no customization, because there's no uniqueness in your solution, you now get to take all the innovation straight away from the industry, and in most cases at, at very little incremental cost, if any. In the end, it is more secure. Larry's point, I thought he touched on it a bit last night, was you know, we fight with very, very seasoned, mature hackers every single day. You think, you know, we're good at it, we fight hard. You want to fight them, or do you think we should fight them? And, and so in the end, because of all the technology, all the capability, more likely to be more secure, not less secure. And you're going to see things like, it, particularly at this conference, things like machine-to-machine -machine AI, all of these terms you hear, of analytics all over the years now being built directly into these applications. For example, AI, you hear a lot of people talking about AI as a separate application. Not sure. I think in the end what you're really going to see is AI built directly into each of these work cases, each of these user cases, where you know when you have an HR application, I'm going to build AI directly into that application. I'm going to build AI directly into my, my customer retention systems, as opposed to exporting data from one of those applications to some AI solution. Everybody wants to tell you about AI right now because if they get on TV and say AI, you know, their stock goes up. But really, application-wise, these are going to become much more features engineered directly into the applications. So this is the what it is. It's, it's infrastructure platform applications that are scaled and optimized, built on standards, cost less, more innovation, more secure, with all sorts of new features and capabilities that are going to get integrated directly into the capabilities. Next chart. Our strategy um, is really to build the apps, the platform, and the infrastructure, and do it to make sure we started, as many of you know that have been coming here for several years, to really get the apps right first get our platform rewritten and built for the cloud, build all these platform services, and then really build out our infrastructure capability. It's been our strategy, and it's been going on for years, um, trying to build out to that, and enable customers to be able to shift to the cloud, or start in the cloud. Now, what I thought I'd do is, is, is for the last several years, uh, several open worlds. Larry gets up on Sunday night and sort of gets up. He did not do this last night. He focused on one solution. But most of the time, he gets up and makes a blizzard of product announcements. So what I thought I'd do is I've taken clips over the last five years of, of uh, Larry um, and talking about all the things we've introduced. So if we could, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's go to Larry. Less than anybody, all three of the major application suites, high end financials, enterprise performance management, talent management, manufacturing, and e-commerce in the cloud. A learning platform that's part of the Oracle Cloud, e-commerce, ERP Cloud for public sector, revenue management. 29 of our 84 products are new this year. Supply chain management, 32 products, 
20 of them new this year. 36 of the 49 are new this year. Telecommunications, healthcare, higher ed, automotive, project management, financial services, consumer products, manufacturing, utilities, financials, accounts payable, general electric, <coughs> receivables, massively upgraded Oracle platform service. A new management cloud, cloud scalability. Big data discovery cloud service. Packaged domain specific applications. Customer insights and engagement cloud service. A complete new suite of Oracle management cloud services. The Oracle Analytics cloud suite. A new suite of tools for cloud centric developers. Oracle Container Registry. App to cloud. The world's first and only fully autonomous database. Infrastructure as a service, as part of our cloud offering. Real application clusters in the cloud. A new generation of data centers that we're building around the world. As I said, we've been very, very busy. You know, I just want to, because sometimes you lose context, I mean, if, you know, as to all of the things that have been going on over the past several years, and it's, you know, like uh, this morning I get asked by uh, on TV about our R&D budget. Our R&D budget's gone from, you know, 3.7 billion a year to 5.2 or so over the past several years. And it's yielded that, that portfolio. And it's really unmatched uh, in the industry to be in a position to offer this much capability. Last night's announcement, arguably one of the biggest we've made over the past five years, and clearly the biggest we've made at the platform and infrastructure level in a long time. So we've been busy building a lot of products to enable the strategy that we've described here. Okay, next uh, chart. Oracle now has, again, the most complete, and I won't go on, you've also you heard Larry say this, I won't uh, pile on, but again, our objective has been to have the most complete suite of SaaS applications. And it isn't just about the suite, it's that each application in itself has to be best of breed and be a suite because we don't believe people are going to have 50 applications, different applications, different data models that don't integrate, that don't work together. It's important to have great apps, but hey, great apps that work together. The most complete suite of PaaS services and the next generation of infrastructure as a service that all work together to complement each other. And that's what we've built out and that's what we now have. Okay, next chart. Okay, I'm going to move into a different thing here. And uh, so, over the last years, I made these predictions, right? And, and you know, like by 2025, 20, I'm not going to read each one of you, each one of them, but 80% of the production apps will be uh, in the cloud. Okay? Um, seems like a pretty good idea to me. 100% uh, of application development and testing will be conducted uh, in the cloud as an example. That's the next uh, to last one. 80% uh, of the number of corporate owned data centers will be decreased by 80%. 100% um, of all enterprise data will be stored in the cloud. That's the third from the bottom. So, made these happen. I did, inc this was done with incredible rigor. Um, and, you know, they're predictions. So you would think not many people would find these, um, you know, that challenging. You wouldn't get that much negative uh, commentary. But let's let's introduce some of these mean uh, tweets that we got. Uh, as Because there's some people who thought that this was just wrong. Not only do they think it's wrong, I mean, I'm just going to leave it. There's some commentary here that I don't think is that thoughtful. Uh, about just how wrong uh, we turn out to be. So why don't we go to some of these mean tweets. I'm just gonna focus on a few of these. I actually would tell you, I thought it would be more appropriate to put the people's names on these tweets. And I got overruled by the handlers uh, and, and legal uh, eventually, which is okay. Um, but it loses some of the impacts. I like. I think accountability is a, is a, big, is a big thing. So let me give you the first one. This this what uh, I like this. You show an amazing. I don't know if this is the one you're showing up here. Yeah, you show an amazing lack of understanding of both the cloud and the future. So it's just not you're wrong. It's just it's an ama It's amazing that that amazing lack of understanding. This one I like. This probably won't come close to meaning me. You won't make. You won't come close to making it to 2025 as CEO. 
Well, the odds are in your favor anyway, right? Just because based on that, okay, this is the best he can do. It's thoughtful. Um, so, very thoughtful. Uh, let's see, some of the other ones. Um, I, this is the one over here. Where, where is this one over here? Let me see if I can see if they've got it up here. When he put the veracity of his predictions into the audience test, the response was overwhelming. None of them would come true. Really? Okay, thank you. Uh, I won't read all of these, but yeah, they are what they are. Let me show you with data what's happened since we've made those predictions. Prediction, this is my prediction. By 2025, the number of corporate owned data centers will decrease by 80%. Let's start with it. That's what I said. Um, now, we've taken this data. I want to make sure you understand this is not from the Mark Hurd Research Department. This is from source data IDC research, right? So, yes, I'm, in this case, I'm a very big supporter of IDC because they sort of agree with me. So, <laughs> 2016, you can see these are the number of data centers, and you now can see they decreased by 15.3%. Space is decreased by 12%. Spend is decreased by 12.8%. I won't take you through all the math. If you compound that through 2025, <laughs> I, I know I was not supposed to do that, that, that grant, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, okay, prediction one. I'm winning so far. Next chart. Okay. By 2025, I said 100% of application development and testing will be in the cloud. We don't really have 2015, we, should, we, we could have, but it will, if you saw 2015 again, it was 20% lower than, than 2016, a little bit more. And now from 2016 to 2017, you got a 20% increase and it's now 52% of all testing. By the way, this is from a software, a survey of software professionals by Dimensional Research. Again, not the Mark Hurd uh, Research Department, right? So if you run the 20% CAGR out. All right, next chart. By 2025, all enterprise data will be stored in the cloud. Now this one I really like, and the reason I like it is this was done at a conference by Cisco, um, and they did a for So after I did these predictions, it was funny. We saw a series, I don't know if we thought this was a trend, a series of people now doing predictions, um, which is great. This is a prediction by 2020, 88% will be in the cloud. More aggressive than me. I just, again, not the Mark Hurd Research Department, this is the Cisco Research Department. Next, uh, this is, I like this one. So here's another one. By 2025, 80% of the production apps will be in the cloud. This is the use of cloud deployment models. Today, 14%. Now we took this from the Enterprise Cloud Workloads and Key Projects Survey. And this is now, we're up to 14%, 20% Now this is a two year model, so you gotta take the two and divide by two. And if you take that CAGR from 14 to 23 and run that CAGR out, you get to 87% in 2025. Now, I only say this to you because I'm going to come out with a new set of predictions. I'm not gonna do it today, I'm gonna to do it at some, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll do it at some cloud world that we'll do, Judy. And, and yeah, and then what I do is, so for those people, I can, we can't go back to the mean tweets, can we? Let's not. All right, we don't have time to do that. I just caught you. Listen, you can take another run at me. Um, I'm telling you that the date, this is just data. This is going to get done. So I think there's two takeaways from that. I wouldn't tweet unless you're really confident in your point of view uh, about these predictions. Second, the inevitability is my point, but getting back to a serious note on the predictions, the inevitability of some of these points isn't just because it's a great idea, it's burying itself out in action and data. And I actually don't think, I actually just did the number straight line tagger, uh, compounded annual growth rate, but I actually don't think that's the way it'll work. 
I know when I did these predictions originally, I said this will go more like this, not linear. And so I actually think these growth rates will accelerate as opposed to stay the same. So this movement to the cloud that all these predictions are based around, this is an inevitable destination as opposed to, to uh, an interesting charismatic term. This is how computing is going to evolve over the next several years. Okay, all right. Uh, with that, I think what we'll do is, what we're gonna do now is talk to some customers, hear from customers about you know, how they're using technology and we've got a number of, of, of both videos um, and customers on stage uh, that will come and share their experiences with us. And the first we're gonna go to is to uh, Caesars Entertainment. Um, and so let's roll the video from, uh, from Caesars. Caesars Entertainment is actually the most diversified casino entertainment company in the world. Technology really is everything. We turned to Oracle because we knew we needed to stay ahead of our competitors by centralizing our systems and making real-time decisions. And we did that by moving to the cloud. This is a real transformation for us because we are standardizing all of our old back office processes with Oracle Cloud. I'm also really excited about going live with the human capital management system. Our foundation really before Oracle Cloud was you know, an old legacy Infinium system and, and Excel. A lot of manual processes and customization as well in our old Infinium system. Now with Oracle Cloud ERP, we're using out-of-the-box technology with no customization and we're eliminating those Excel spreadsheets, so it's pretty exciting. The product, product's so mature now, we were very confident in bringing that into our, our situation and we've proven that it really does work. Now, when we think about the future, cloud is our future. We can use our resources in other much more high-value ways and that is always good for business and it's good for the bottom line. We have to maintain an extremely high level of security because of our business and gaming regulations. And Oracle's security model really does that for us. We know we have a competitive advantage among the large gaming companies in Las Vegas. Caesars Entertainment is actually the first, the very first here, to move to a cloud-based financial system. We are automating many things that have historically been manual, disconnected processes for us. That means we are working faster and more collaboratively. And at the same time, we're not carrying that high cost of maintaining on-premise technology. We really save millions and millions of dollars in annual IT costs. We have really grown to really know and trust Oracle as we have moved along this big journey. We've created a roadmap together and it's constantly evolving. So whenever we have questions, no matter how challenging, how complicated, the Oracle Cloud team has really been there for us. First, I'd like to thank Mark and Keith for doing that, uh, that video for us. Our best to everyone at Caesars. Uh, uh, tough, uh, tough day in Vegas. They're a great, uh, great customer. And again, all the best to, uh, uh, to them. I'm joined on stage by, uh, by Chris Wood. Chris is in charge of transformation at FedEx. Uh, thank you for joining us. It's, thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Great crowd. Love you. Love yeah. me here in Oracle. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe you could give us a little background on the FedEx business. Tell us a little bit. I mean, you've got a lot of competitors, sort of like we do. Tell us a little bit about how you're dealing with them. Well, at FedEx, we're always focused on a couple of key components. We're, we're investing in our business. We're innovating in the marketplace. We're always trying to deliver the highest uh, reliable service to our customers. And some of the things we've been doing recently on the investment front is uh, modernizing our fleets. That's not just our airplanes, but also our vehicle fleets. And that's going to enable us to have uh, more capacity. Not only that, it's going to reduce the amount of fossil fuels that we use and lower our carbon footprint for the, for the same amount of weights that we ship. So we think it's a good thing for FedEx and a good thing for, the, for everyone. Uh, and our biggest recent investment is to expand our network. We just completed the biggest acquisition FedEx has ever done. That's the acquisition of the TGT company. It's a European-based shipper. Uh, and they have global operations. And this is going to really expand our capabilities internationally and allow us to meet more of our customer needs. So tell us, as you transform from moving packages to you know, basically delivering business services, now FedEx has got a whole suite of services. What does that mean to, to you, to FedEx, and to all of us as customers? 
It means that FedEx is focusing truly on building the largest portfolio of transportation services and support services that are possible. That's not just our shipping and packaging that everyone's familiar with. That's warehousing, it's inventory management, it's a full logistics uh, suite. We're trying to help our customers uh, and provide them with as many services as possible as it relates to their, their shipping and logistics needs. <coughs> all right, so tell us a little bit about Oracle. How does Oracle Cloud play in all of this? <coughs> Absolutely. So we, at FedEx, we're trying to, to devote and focus our internal IT resources on the things that are of highest value to us, our customer-facing systems, our shipping and tracking systems, our management operations systems, the things that we feel need to be tailored for us and more customized. At the same time that our CIO has challenged us to reduce the investment in infrastructure in IT for all other non-operation activities. Rob's not, yeah, Rob Carter, who's the CIO, in fact, but Rob's not increasing the IT budgets at FedEx a lot? No, that's not, that's not uh, fashionable right now. So uh, uh, we are trying to figure out ways to uh, deliver more functionality and to uh, support what we need to do in the business and be more nimble, but at the same time reduce our costs. And Oracle Cloud is a big part of that. So our first step, we just begun the journey to Oracle Cloud, and our first step was to take one of our recent acquisitions, not the, not the TNT, a smaller one that we've recently made, and move them straight to the cloud, which allows us our uh, chance to uh, experience the cloud, understand what it means for us, and develop our model for what we want to do for the rest of FedEx. And we're finishing up that exercise right now. Yeah, so e-business suite and a big part of FedEx, but Genco, the, the, the starting point, you know, bring the Oracle Cloud there and yeah. begin to matriculate it. Exactly. The Genco acquisition as part of our supply chain business was using the e-business suite on premise, and they were using it in financials, AR billing, inventory management, uh, warehouse uh, management, and we we're replacing all that with Oracle Cloud. What, uh, Chris, what benefits do you expect to get out of all of this? Well, some benefits I think that most customers see when they move and transition to cloud and specifically work cloud. It's, it's speed to market, the projects don't take as long, it's reliability, it's scalability, and it's uh, delivering that the most recent current functionality at the fastest possible time to the business. Okay. Any thoughts about the, the overall relationship between Oracle and FedEx? I mean, we've obviously worked together for a long time, but love to hear the current state you believe in the relationship? We, we have a long-standing relationship, but what I really appreciate now and what I think is most resonates most with me personally is that it's easy to see that Oracle's committed to becoming a true partner in FedEx. It's not a vendor relationship. It's really a partnership where you guys are interested in our business and um, you, your account team has done a great job of spending time with us, trying to learn about our business, learn our youth where our, what our unique needs are, and helping and advising us on how best to use the cloud offerings to meet those needs. And then even more importantly for us, long term, is our, our interaction with your development team. So the development team has allowed FedEx to have some conversations with them. I sit on a CFO panel that's a great uh, vehicle to talk to people like Safra and Jeff, and to talk to your senior VPs of development, and describe what we think works well for the product, what we think we'd like to see different, and they take that into consideration as they evolve the product over time. They have the opportunity to prioritize features and release. Absolutely. 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 It's a great relationship. It's fantastic. Well, listen, FedEx, fantastic company, founder led, uh, just a tremendous uh, story, tremendous company. Uh, we're proud to, to be part of working uh, with you. So Thank you. thanks for doing this, Chris. All right. I really Thank appreciate you. it. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to roll into another video. So let's roll into the city. Uh, this is the uh, city of San Jose, and we're going to hear about their journey uh, to the cloud. I'm Sam Licardo, the mayor of the city of San Jose. I have the great honor of serving more than one million residents here in America's 10th largest city. If we could make City Hall as innovative as the community we serve, I knew that we could make San Jose the most innovative city in America by the year 2020. My Smart City vision focuses on how we can make San Jose safer, more livable, more sustainable, and more user-friendly. A critical component of being more user-friendly is enabling our residents to better communicate with City Hall about the needs in their own neighborhood. A critical part of our strategy has been partnering with the world's leading innovative companies. And we're delighted that we found Oracle because of that platform approach, the data approach, the artificial intelligence and machine learning tools that they have, direct chat 
All these things are becoming very important to us for omnichannel communications so that we can have that digital front door. Oracle's role in that was through Oracle Service Cloud and Oracle Integration uh, Cloud, and how are we going to connect all the systems that we have to be able to render this new level of service. So we're really trying to build the city of the future and allow our residents at the touch of a button to interact with City Hall. We're working on a number of future-looking initiatives, including autonomous vehicles, as well as the Internet of Things, and using the city as a platform to test what the next generation of transportation is going to look like, the next generation of connectivity. With the assistance of Oracle Cloud, we're able to seamlessly integrate the back-end function to ensure that every request that was made through the MySynthesA app is routed directly to the department responsible so they can be responding as quickly as possible. We know we'd love to have more money and more employees. We simply don't. And so we need to be able to leverage great technology to make our employees more effective. And that's the Smart City vision. No, that's great. Thanks to the mayor and the whole team of the city of San Jose for doing that. That's uh, superb. Thank you. Um, well, I'm uh, joined on stage by Randy Furr. Randy is the CFO of Bloom Energy, so we give Randy a hand. <laughs> and when I mentioned uh, Bloom earlier, is one of those disruptors uh, in the energy uh, segment. So maybe we start by your stated mission. I want to make sure I got this right. Make clean energy affordable. How does Bloom plan to do that? Yeah, well, thanks, Mark, for the invitation. Um, so Bloom Energy generates clean, reliable um, electrical power. We do it on site, um, and we do it in a way that uh, has minimal impact on the environment. With Bloom, you get high-quality energy. Uh, we have low or no green gas emissions. Low local air pollutants, which is very important in many parts of the world, virtually no water use, and we can serve land because of our small physical footprint. Now, the key to these sustainability solutions is Bloom's very high efficiency, of which our unique technology converts the fuel to electricity. It's the highest level in the world. But in addition to these sustainability benefits, we provide our customers a cost savings on their power bill, sometimes as much as 20%. That's good, right? I mean, 20%. 20% is good. I got agree. Yeah, 20% is good. All right, so let's talk a little bit about customer expectation shifting in this space. I mean, obviously, in fact, you can do what you can do. You've got environmental expectations, you've got cost expectations, et cetera, but how do you stay ahead of those expectations of customers? Well, look, our customers, have a variety of concerns. I could boil them down into kind of four primary areas. One is they just simply want greater control over their energy destiny. And by Bloom providing that service on site helps the customers achieve that goal. Secondly, and as I'm sure everybody can imagine, they want, are very concerned about the quality and the reliability of, uh, of their energy. Uh, in today's increasingly digital world, even us, momentary flicker of the power has implications on customers. With the unfortunate things we've seen with the hurricane, uh, obviously cyber attacks, attacks on the grid, all that's had impacts on the security. Bloom can provide mission critical power and uh, you know that, that helps our customers with the, that, that issues of quality and reliability. Third is you know the environment. Our customers are concerned about the environment. Uh, we're often mentioned in our customers' annual reports in terms of sustainability requirements and how we help them meet those requirements. Um, you know, we're, we're, we've only been shipping product for eight years, pretty short period of time, but already a quarter of the Fortune 100 we can claim as customers. Customers include companies like Apple, eBay, Kaiser Hospitals, AT&T, Home Depot, Walmart, several of these customers. So, um, sustainability 